Uh, I'm going to present only one half of the work and the second half of the work is in progress. Uh, this is a work that I've been doing with my supervisor, uh, Professor Varun Sahani, as well as with Professor Alexis Tarovinsky from uh, Landau Institute. So uh, the work that I'm presenting today uh, got uh, published in uh, JCAP at the end of uh, the month May. So let me uh, begin uh, by just uh, uh, giving a short introduction uh, that uh, uh, enormous amount of uh, theoretical and observational developments in the past three to four decades have yielded in the standard model of cosmology in the form of a flat lambda CD model. And uh, uh, the lambda CD model is uh, based on uh, sort of three initial conditions based on the spatial homogeneity and isotropy, uh, the uh, flatness, uh, the space curvature being close to zero, as well as uh, the presence of uh, initial fluctuations, which are almost scale invariant, nearly Gaussian and adiabatic. Uh, and assuming these facts, we can explain the evolution of the universe from, uh, from starting from about one second all the way until 13.8 billion years uh, today. And inflation, uh, cosmic inflation, the inflation paradigm has uh, emerged as the leading paradigm of the early universe, uh, explaining all the three initial conditions uh, in sort of natural way. <clears throat> And uh, so uh, the main work of cosmic inflation is to set uh, the uh, appropriate initial conditions for the hot big bang phase. So uh, regarding cosmic uh, in cosmic inflation, uh, in the standard slow roll single field canonical inflationary model, um, you you typically have you have a potential uh, where you have a scalar field which rolls down the potential. Uh, as long as the scalar field is rolling down slowly. As long as its uh, kinetic energy is smaller compared to its potential energy, universe accelerates uh, and inflation happens. And sometime later, the field falls to the minimum of the potential and it reheats the universe. So oscillations uh, during uh, uh, after the end of inflation leads to uh, reheating. The condition for having acceleration uh, is that uh, this epsilon h parameter has to be smaller than one, and the epsilon h parameter is uh, minus of h dot h is the Hubble divided by h square to be smaller than one, which leads to the kinetic twice the kinetic energy to be smaller than the potential energy. And the dynamics of the scalar field is governed by uh, the second order differential equation, where the expansion of the universe acts like a friction term. Um, now, in the standard slow roll approximation, uh, we have uh, the first slow roll parameter, which I which I mentioned in the last page. As well as the second slow roll parameter, both to be smaller than one. Okay, uh, and in the standard slow roll design, uh, the the power spectrum of scalar fluctuations uh, defined as uh, uh, kq by two pi squared into the co-moving curvature perturbation Fourier modes square uh, turns out uh, to take a very simple form, which is one by eight pi square Hubble square uh, compared to Planck mass square uh, divided by the first slow roll parameter epsilon x. Similarly, the tensor fluctuations uh, have a similar formula, which only depends on Hubble and not on the first slow roll parameter. This is in the slow roll design. So we have a scalar power spectrum for scalar fluctuations and tensor uh, power spectrum for tensor fluctuations. Now, during this slow roll design, we can uh, uh, we can sort of approximate the power spectrum in the form of a power law, uh, where at a pivot scale k star, which is nowadays taken to be 0 0.05 megaparsec inverse. Uh, at the pivot scale, you have some amplitude of uh, power spectrum, and then with change in the wave number, uh, the power falls off as a spectral index, nx minus, ns minus one. The same thing is also true for the tensor power spectrum with a tensor amplitude and under tensor index. <clears throat> the scalar amplitude is given by the Hubble uh, square divided by epsilon x, both these quantities to be computed at the time when the pivot scale leaves the horizon during inflation. Similarly, the tensor fluctuation is given by Hubble square in flat square, again calculated at the uh, horizon exit of the pivot scale. Um, the two parameters which are important for our discussion today are the scalar spectral index NS, actually NS minus one, and the tensor power uh, and the tensor to scalar ratio, uh, which is uh, 16 times epsilon. Both these quantities are important for us. And as you can see in the slow roll design, since these quantities are small, NS is close to one of two percent level, uh, and uh, since uh, uh, and uh, the first low, the value of the first slow roll parameter determines the value of uh, the tensor to scalar ratio. 
uh, typically the fluctuations are produced in the following way that we have the co-moving Hubble horizon or Hubble radius falling during inflation and then rising after the end of inflation. So this is where inflation ends. And these fluctuations are initially produced as quantum fluctuations in the sub-horizon scale, which are then uh, stretched to the super-horizon scales. Uh, and then they remain constant. And much later, they, re they make a horizon re-entry or Hubble re-entry. And then they create the density fluctuations that we see for scalar case. And they create gravitational waves for, for the tensor case. That's the standard mechanism. Now, what do we know from observations so far? Uh, we know uh, that uh, the tensor to scalar ratio is kind of less than 0 0.06. And uh, uh, the uh, spectral scalar spectral index, NS, is somewhat around 0 0.965 uh, plus minus a small percent level uh, deviation from it. So that is the CMB2 sigma bound that I'm showing here. And given this bound, a lot of models are already ruled out, especially models which have convex potential. But still, there are a lot of models which also satisfy the data. Uh, some of the models I have mentioned here are the T model alpha attractors, the tan hyperbolic potential, which, which are these olive color lines. Then uh, the E model alpha attractors, which are these cyan color lines here. Uh, and uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the KKLT inflation, which, uh, which has for, for the quadratic KKLT with n equal to 2, which is the orange color line. Okay. And the Starobinsky inflation sits right here in the blue color uh, uh, dots. Okay. The big dot is for a uh, number of E-folds uh, before the end of inflation when the pivot scale made, um, made a horizon exit, taking it as 60 for the big dot and taking it as 50 for the small dot. So this is what we know from observation. So observations favor asymptotically flat uh, concave potentials uh, given the data and given the upper bound on the tensor to scalar ratio we also have upper bound on the Hubble scale during inflation which is around 6 into 10 to the power 13 uh, GeV. Okay now let's let's go to inflationary degeneracies. Uh, there are several models of inflation uh, which, which, ne which leads to the same prediction in NSNR. So that's the degeneracy that we are talking about. Now this could arise because of two reasons. The first one could be because they are completely different models, but they have the same prediction of NSNR. Or you have one model in which there is some extra parameter lambda, and as you vary this extra parameter lambda, your NSNR predictions do not change. Okay, so there are these two ways in which uh, you, you may have degeneracies in NSNR of, of different uh, inflationary models. And I'm going to talk about the second thing in this talk that if it, you have a model in which you have a potential, but it has extra parameter lambda, and as that lambda varies, NS and R values do not vary. <clears throat> so, given these degeneracies, CMB observations cannot uniquely constitute a probe of uh, inflation, at least as far as the uh, two point correlation is concerned. <clears throat> so, let me uh, demonstrate uh, some, some of these degeneracies. The first degeneracy that I will talk about uh, has to do with the T model of alpha attractor. Uh, which has a tan hyperbolic potential and the typical form is tan hyperbolic to the power 2p where p could be 1, 2, 3, etc. And this lambda parameter which I put here is, is like 1 by root 6 alpha in, in the usual uh, uh, alpha which is related to the curvature of the Taylor metric. Anyway, I put it lambda because this is uh, much more simpler in, in the form. And this potential has a, a two, it, it's symmetric, it has two asymptotically flat wings and as well as a minimum where reheating happens. Okay. <clears throat> after, after the end of inflation, the, the inflaton field oscillates around the minimum and which has an average equation of state of P minus one by P plus one, where P equal to one leads to tan square. And accordingly, P equal to two is tan fourth and three is tan sixth. However, when lambda is greater than 0 0.1, both NS and R become independent of P. So whether I take tan square or tan fourth or tan sixth, uh, NS and R uh, lead to the same value as, as long as alpha is greater than 0 0.1. This is shown in this next figure. Uh, when lambda is uh, uh, smaller than 0 0.1, uh, then uh, P equal to 1, P equal to 2, and P equal to 3 have different predictions. But as it goes beyond 0 0.1, they all lead to the same prediction. Uh, this is NS and this is R. Especially in the data which is allowed by observation, we have these degeneracies. Uh, so 
the predictions are independent of t in this region. Okay. Same thing happens also for E models of alpha attractor, where uh, the potential has exponential form. Uh, and uh, for p equal to 1 and lambda equal to 2 by root 6, this is the Starobinsky model. Otherwise, this lambda is a variable, uh, is a, uh, could be any, any value for, for the E model. Uh, this is an asymmetric potential. And again, inflation happens on the uh, asymptotically flat wing, and then reheating happens around the minimum. It also has a similar equation of state during oscillation, p minus 1 by p plus 1. But for lambda greater than 0 0.5, you have ns and r leading to the same value, independent of the value of p. And this also has the same similar diagram, uh, where for lambda greater than 0 0.5, ns and r for all the three values of p become the same. So that's the reason to see that, uh, uh, that we talk about in this paper. Now, to, to break the reason receive, there are a few important facts we have to take into account. The first thing is the post-inflationary evolution. The post-inflation, after, after inflation is over, the scalar field oscillates around the minimum and reheats the universe. And uh, one of them, so our universe makes a transition from the inflationary accelerating phase to the hot Big Bang phase through this period of reheat, where, it, uh, where particle production happens and then universe thermalizes to the hot Big Bang phase. Now, there are two implications of this uh, reheating phase. The first being that where is phi star? What is the value of phi when the pivot scale left Hubble scale? How many e folds before the end of inflation it exists uh, or it, ex uh, it exited horizon? Uh, that value is uncertain unless we know the details of reheating. Okay? So if we know the re exact reheating details, then we can, for a given model, we can predict where the phi star would be. That's the first thing. Um, and then, the second thing is, by putting some details of reheating, we can actually break the degeneracies of some of the inflationary models, okay, which I will show. And the third thing is obviously the physics of reheating is extremely exciting to everyone, to, to theorists like me. <clears throat> uh, so after the end of inflation, the inflation field is oscillating coherently, and that could be thought of as made up of several uh, massive fields of mass M, uh, all of which have almost zero momenta. And, uh, then the, if, if the field is coupled to any other fermions or bosons, or it has self-coupling, then the field could uh, decay by different ways. Now, the one of the things, the, well, it could decay by perturbatively or it could decay non-perturbatively. In this talk, I'll only talk about perturbative decay. Uh, the first focus in our paper was only on perturbative decay. The perturb in perturbative decay, the massive inflaton field decays into uh, massless bosons and fermions, or very low mass bosons and fermions. Uh, reheating completes when the Hubble uh, rate falls below the rate of decay. Okay? And typically, the reheating temperature is given by 0 0.1 into root over of uh, uh, decay rate into n plaque. Given that uh, the decay rate has to be small, otherwise the, uh, the shape of the potential changes, typically in the, in the perturbative reheating case, we get a very low reheating temperature, uh, which is uh, smaller than 10 to the power 9 GeV. So it has a low reheating temperature, long duration of reheating in the perturbative case. Uh, similarly, there is non-perturbative reheating, which could happen either by parametric resonance in an oscillatory potential or by instant reheating, which is uh, valid both for oscillatory as well as non-oscillatory. Okay, so coming to purely to perturbative reheating, if the inflaton field is oscillating around the potential phi to the power 2 phi, then its equation of average equation of state is p minus 1 by p plus 1 would be the reheating equation of state in the perturbative design. Okay. So it could be 0 if p equal to 1. It could be uh, 1 by 3 if p equal to 2. Or it could be 1 by 2 if p equal to 3. If the equation of state is less than 1 by 3, we'll call it shallow equation of state. And if it is greater than 1 by 3, we'll call it stiff equation of state. <clears throat> now, uh, the details of reheating uh, kinematically, it depends on three parameters: the equation of uh, uh, the equation of state during reheating, the duration of reheating, as well as the place where reheating ends, so the temperature of reheating. So there are three kinematical variables by which we can uh, uh, describe the period of reheating. And uh, if the equation of state during reheating is not equal to one third, then the duration of reheating is related to uh, the number of e folds before which the pivot scale left horizon through the uh, equation of state during reheating. Okay. In the perturbative design, we know the equation of state during reheating, hence we have a uh, relation between both of them. 
Similarly, the temperature of free heating is related to uh, the, the duration of free heating. So longer is the duration, shorter is the reheating temperature. Okay. <clears throat> now, if the reheating equation state is one third, then we get some sharp predictions for uh, the number of few folds before which the pivots get left the horizon. Okay. Now, if we take into account some simple facts that the tensor to scalar ratio is less than 0 0.06, uh, which leads to a, a, an upper bound on the Hubble parameter and hence the reheating temperature, then we could put some conservative limits on, 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 on reheating temperature. The most conservative limit is that uh, reheating could be as low as 1 MeV, but not lower. Otherwise, Big Bang nucleosynthesis would be uh, disturbed. And it could be as high as 10 to the power 16 G. If we put this very conservative limit, uh, this is very uh, this is uh, good enough to break inflationary degeneracies in NSNR in the kind of models that we discussed. <clears throat> uh, here, we, we impose such, uh, uh, such conditions that uh, the reheating temperature has to be greater than 1 MeV and smaller than 10 to the plus 16 GeV. Then, uh, then P equal to 1 case or P equal to 2 case, which is a sharp prediction because the equation of state is 1 third, and P equal to 3 case are segregated into different uh, bins. And what we see is for P equal to 1, the number of E-folds is in between 50 and 55. For P equal to 2, it is around 55. And for P equal to 3, it is around, uh, it is in between 55 to 60. So we get segregation of predictions of uh, NS and R for all three models once we take into account the reheating details. Now, not only reheating can break uh, the inflationary degeneracies, even gravitational waves would help uh, in breaking the uh, inflationary degeneracies because the spectrum is uh, sensitive to the post-inflationary uh, evolution of the universe. Uh, the inflationary uh, gravitational waves, primordial gravitational waves, they have a range of frequencies that is possible because the universe expanded for about into the past 60 to 70 times, at least during inflation. <clears throat> now, these tensor fluctuations are also produced as quantum fluctuations in the sub horizon scale, and then they're stretched uh, to become constant on the super horizon scale. And later, they enter the, they make horizon entry at some point in the early universe, either during uh, the reheating phase or in the hot Big Bang phase, or even in the matter dominated epoch. And then they behave like gravitational waves. And we, we can observe those gravitational waves either through their imprints on CMB or uh, by direct detection uh, of stochastic gravitational waves in the future. <clears throat> the frequency of a gravitational wave, uh, that, which is detected today, uh, depends on when it made the horizon entry in the early universe. And depending on that, the frequency would be about 7 into 10 to the power minus 8 hertz if the horizon entry happened around 1 GeV. And if the horizon entry happened uh, earlier than 1 GeV temperature, then it will have higher frequency. If it happens later, then it will have lower frequency. Uh, uh, if, if a tensor mode ma makes its horizon entry around uh, uh, the matter radiation equality, then it has a uh, frequency of 10 to the power minus 17 hertz. Otherwise, if it enters earlier, it has higher frequency. Now, the gravitational, uh, the spectral uh, <clears throat> density uh, of gravitational waves uh, is normalized with respect to the uh, critical density today. And during uh, radiation, uh, during the tensor modes, which make their Hubble entry during radiation dominated epoch, it's almost a flat spectrum with a very tiny uh, primordial tilt. While if they enter during reheating, depending on the reheating uh, equation of state of the universe during reheating, it may have a large tilt. Uh, so the, the tilt is usually given by the primordial tilt plus a term which depends on the reheating equation of state. So if equation of state during reheating is, is uh, uh, stiffer than uh, radiation, then we have a blue tilt. And if it is shallower, then we'll have a red tilt. Hence, the signal will be different. Uh, and it's also different for different p values. And uh, if, if p is 2, it is flat. If P is three or four, it will be stiffer and you will have uh, blue tilted gravitational waves, which might be detected by future observatories. Uh, here I show the same diagram for a different uh, reheating temperature. And here I show for a P equal to three, P equal to two, and P equal to one for three, uh, for, for two different uh, reheating temperatures. So the summary is the following. Thank you very much. <laughs>